we're going to talk about the group problem solving steps that you as a leader should be guiding your groups and teams through anytime you are making an important decision or solving an important problem. We are working out of BB and Masterson's book on communicating in small groups. I'll put a link to that in the description below, but you're going to see these group problem solving steps in just about any book on the topic. So let's get into the details. Randy Hirakawa from the University of Hawaii Hilo has been doing research on groups and group decision makings for decades. And he's got lots of great findings on what makes groups effective and ineffective when they are solving problems and making decisions together. Effective groups, he has found, follow a clear process to make those decisions and solve those problems where ineffective groups do not follow a clear process. So Hirakawa and other researchers found that these five steps we're going to talk about, all five of them are really important, but there are some key steps, three key steps that are the best predictors of quality group performance. Those are steps one, two, and five. I will highlight them as we go. And I want to make a note that this problem solving schema is really based upon and resembles John Dewey's problem solving steps, that classic list of seven steps. So we'll be referencing that toward the end of the video. So step number one is to develop an accurate understanding of the problem. This is a key step, one of the three key steps that predicts effective outcomes, quality outcomes. You have to get really clear on what the problem is you're trying to solve if you want to develop a high quality solution in the end. So one of the ways to do this is to identify the root causes, the symptoms, and discuss the history of the problem to get a good picture of it. You can also do what's called an is or is not analysis, where you make a T-chart and you list all the issues that, that are the problem, this is the problem, and all the things that are not the problem is not. So when you eliminate some of the things on the is not side of the ledger, you get much more clear on what actually is the problem. And so your eventual solution will target that specific problem and it won't be a confused or blurry solution. You can use the journalist's six questions, this classic set of questions that journalists are supposed to ask when they're investigating an issue, the who, what, when, where, how, and why, so that you get a well-rounded picture you look at the problem from various angles and have a comprehensive understanding of what it is. You can also look at data and other available information rather than just speculating and trying to use the power of your own logic to figure it out. You wanna look at actual data, actual information to get a firm grasp on the issues. You shouldn't be guessing. That's step number one. Step number two is to develop requirements for an acceptable choice in the end. This is another key step that will predict whether or not your group is going to come up with a quality outcome. Some people call this the ideal choice, the ideal solution criteria. That's where you establish explicit standards for an acceptable solution. You have to ask questions like, what would a good solution look like? What would it include? What would it not include? For example, you might say a good, a good solution would not increase costs above a certain level. So that way you know when you get to that solution stage of this process, if it increases costs too much, then it's not yet a good solution. So does the solution accurately correct the problem as defined as it is? So when you're working on defining the problem and then get really clear on what'll solve it, that'll help you later in the process when you weigh the strengths and weaknesses of your potential solution. So that's step number two, developing that acceptable criteria for a solution. Number three, develop many alternatives to the problem more potential solutions increases the chances of finding a high quality solution. So you get more ideas on the table, you have more ideas to choose from that may solve that. One of the classic ways to do this is through group brainstorming. So you can brainstorm and come up with lots of different ideas and have some fun generating ideas in the first place without judgment. And then you're probably gonna get some better solutions through that process than had you just jumped to the conclusion without fully looking at all the alternatives. There are some limitations, however, lots of things like group pressure and, and the extroverted people talk more and things like that. So along the way, people developed another version of this called the nominal group technique, where essentially, to boil it down, people prepare individually ahead of time. So individually, they come up with as many possible solutions as they can come up with and draft them out. And then when they come together as a group, 
they're not going to be unduly influenced by the first person who talks because they have already prepared their thoughts and and there'll be time for everybody to share their thoughts. And if they have them in front of them, even the introverted people or the people who aren't as confident will eventually get a chance to throw the ideas on the table. And again, more ideas increases the chances of a good idea. You can also have a structured debate. Now, this isn't easy, but it is possible to have a good, healthy, respectful debate about the different options you're considering and what you think are the best options. And one of the re reasons why debate is good is it can often push the thinking of the people with the ideas. They'll take a solution and it'll, they'll, it'll help them make it better. When someone points out some issues with it, they'll refine it and improve it and improve it. So debate can be very helpful in letting good ideas rise to the top. That's the classic reason for debate, but also it'll help refine those ideas along the way. You don't, however, just wanna have an outright argument or fight about it. You wanna have a civil, professional, and, and structured debate that makes sense and has, follows a logical structure and pattern. There are some notes. Beware of criticism. You don't wanna just criticize an idea as soon as it comes out. You have to let it sit on the table for a while. There's plenty of time to critique these later. If you criticize each idea as it comes out, then it's going to kill the vibe. It's gonna destroy the brainstorming session right there. You also don't want to use group pressure or leader pressure to push your ideas too early on the group. You have to let this discussion unfold and be sure to take full advantage of individual's input. That's why we do that nominal group technique. You have to get every individual in the discussion to really use the full power of the group. You may want to use for this reason a skilled facilitator. If you have a group leader who's too dominant and they're pushy with their ideas, it's not gonna work. You're just gonna end up with what the leader would have picked anyway. And it's very unlikely that the leader of any given group is going to have the best idea all the time. That's just not realistic. You have to get all the ideas on the table first. So you want to, if you can, use a skilled facilitator. That's the way to really get the most out of a brainstorming session. And step number four, assess the positive features of the solution alternatives. So look at each solution and talk about all the potential benefits and merits of the idea. Make a list of all of the ideas and thoroughly discuss all of those positive aspects of them. Number five is another key step. Assess the negative features of the solution alternatives. So this is that third key step that predicts quality outcomes. Carefully consider the potential downside of each solution. So list all of the potential problems. You have to reach a point where you say, okay, now let's talk about the potential problems of this option. Discuss them thoroughly. And even you may want to assign a devil's advocate or two to play the role of pointing out the flaws and criticizing the ideas and looking at the potential downsides. You have to have this in there. And I think the key point for this is that looking at a solution with open eyes will help prevent poor solutions from moving forward. So this step is so critical, I believe, because if you really look at the problems, then you might have a, oh, this sounds so cool, but once you look at the real problems that it might come with, it'll prevent you from advancing bad solutions into that decision-making phase where they actually get implemented. So this will stop poor decisions from moving forward if you do this step thoroughly. That's why I believe it's so important. And then John Dewey has step six and seven where you select the best solutions through some various method like consensus, majority vote, ranking and rating, et cetera. And then step seven is where you implement and test the solution. So this is where you roll it out and see how it goes. And then of course, potentially refine it and improve it. So here are some key takeaways. Effective groups follow a decision-making process and a problem-solving process. They don't just wing it. They don't just see where the conversation goes. They don't just go with the flow, they have a process. They spell out that process in advance so everybody understands what the roadmap is. And it's especially important to thoroughly understand the problem you're trying to solve. That's one of the key steps. Establish criteria for an acceptable solution. That's the second key step. And the third key step is to evaluate the potential downside of proposed solutions. This will prevent bad solutions from advancing in the process. Question of the day. Which of these steps do you feel like you could benefit from getting better at the most? Where do your skills as a leader, as a participant, need the most work? I would love to hear your answer to that question in that comment section below the video. I look forward to reading them. So thanks. Until next time, I will see you soon.